Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter, and it's a, a real honour to, to be able to fulfil this role, and I'm really looking forward to the next uh, 18 months or so as we go on this, this journey. Uh, so one of the things that you're probably sitting back there now is thinking, well, you know, it's going to be kind of interesting, isn't it? So these programs are interesting, they're challenging, they're exciting and they're tough and there are moments of anguish and, and angst. Uh, and why do we do it? So I'm going to try and give you some, well, I'm going to try, I'm going to give you some perspective as to why we're going down this, this road. So um, I'm going to start by saying, well, you know, the answer is digital, but what question are we answering when we, when we look at this? Uh, and really, it's, it's how we move to the use of information. How do we move from all the data that we're collecting right across the system to turn it into information that we can use to make really good decisions? That's pretty simple, really. Um, now, our digital journey started way back here in 1897 when uh, JJ Thompson discovered the electron, the first fundamental particle of physics, which is the reason that we have digital technology. And this plaque that you see here sits on the wall of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Uh, and you can go and stand under it and take pictures of it like I've done with all my kids. And it's really an inspiring sight. Uh, J.J. Thompson won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1906 for showing that the electron was a particle. And in the bizarre world of quantum physics, his son, 35 years later, won the Nobel Prize of Physics for showing that the electron was a wave. And they were both right. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, now, Matthew, I see Matthew up the back there. Just down about 100 metres from this plaque is the Eagle Pub, and on the wall of the Eagle Pub is the uh, discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick, where they announced it to their students. So it's a really quite a heady atmosphere. If you go across the country a little way to a, another place called Oxford, um, this young chap here, Tim Berners-Lee, when he was uh, working there and then went to work at CERN, he invented uh, or discovered uh, or developed the, inter the World Wide Web, not the internet, the World Wide Web, um, uh, uh, something that was described by his supervisor at the time as vague but exciting. <laughs> Um, now, now, you might ask, well, why did Tim go to all this trouble to build the World Wide Web? And it's really important, it's really interesting when we think about what we do in health. And if you look at his, um, if you look at his original thesis, and there's that vague but interesting quote, um, just read this. In those days, different information on different computers, different log on to get to it. Sometimes you had to learn different program each computer. Often it was just easy to go and ask people when they were having coffee. Sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the world we live in today, isn't it, in, in healthcare. So, you know, this was 30, 30 odd years ago, pretty much exactly 30 years ago now, uh, and we're still catching up in health, aren't we? And yet our whole life is invaded, pervaded, persuaded by all these digital technologies that we have at our fingertips in every walk of our life. Except, of course, in healthcare, where uh, we still rely on this sort of thing. Yeah. So there are still a lots of places that are just paper-based, and and I think you know, I'm running out the vaccine program. We're still going to be faxing stuff around. Of course, the fax is end-to-end -end encrypted. It's very safe, but of course, when the paper falls off, it's not the most ideal way of exchanging information, and we can certainly do better. Now. Healthcare has been really successful. So here's, here's one of the great, great story, great news stories about health. So here we are back in just after World War II, uh, when the average life expectancy of a male in Australia, in the UK and the US was about 63, 64 years old. So, you know, I'd, I'd have 50% chance of being dead if, I'd, if I was in that, that, uh, that era. Sobering, isn't it? Whereas now it's over 80. For, for males, 84 for males, I think 86 for females. And what a wonderful story that is. But of course, we all recognise increasingly that as our population ages, when they get to that last year or two of life, uh, that they start to, to consume or deserve, is a much better word, much more in terms of resources and healthcare. And, and we're all struggling as to how are we going to cope with that. And I can tell you that the only game in town in terms of how we as a society and, and, and we as a healthcare organisation are going to cope is with the digital uh, agenda. And of course, when you add into that the, the sort of lifestyle diseases of the 21st century, you start to bring that demand back uh, into even, even younger age groups. And when you add the ageing population, the chronic comorbid diseases, the impact on the health system is phenomenal. And we really need high quality information to know how best to deal with these people, how to set up systems and how to treat them all, both on an individual and population basis. 
Now, when you don't understand the healthcare system, you put together nightmares like this, which is the, the NHS. Uh, and um, I say this deliberately, this is a King's Fund diagram, and when you look at what's happened there is that, and, and we see this playing out now with how they've responded or not responded to COVID, the reason is that they don't understand the system there and they don't have the right information to make decisions. And if you look at all of that, that's where clinical services are delivered. The rest of it is an overhead of reporting and bureaucracy that's just absolutely um, killing them, uh, both figuratively and literally at the current time. It's really quite sad. But that has come about because there's no information there to tell people how to set this system up more effectively. Now, um, when you look at, uh, at those systems, we work in a really complex, chaotic system. If you model it mathematically, um, this is what we've got. We've got a chaotic system. And I want to give you an example of, oh, this is interesting. Anyway, I'll give you an example here of um, ventricular fibrillation. Uh, now, work that we did in Cambridge, where of course we, we went, went with EPIC and we were able to consume lots of data. We worked with uh, Caltech University. Um, when you look at that tracing of ventricular fibrillation, you see what looks like a random series of electrical discharges across the heart. When you examine those electrical vectors on very sophisticated machinery, um, and you'll be able to do this, and, and Afsal Chowdhury will tell you about some of this later on today, um, through the EPIC platform, when you examine the electrical vectors there, you can, ex you can take it down to the granularity of one one hundredth of a microsecond, right? Think of that, one one hundredth of a microsecond. And when you do that, and you look at the patterns, you can see, you can actually start to model that. So you can start to model what we thought was chaos. You start to understand what was really complex, chaotic uh, sort of situation. What's even more exciting is that if you look at the tracing before, which to our eyes would look normal, you can start to see perturbations in those electrical vectors uh, which predict the onset of that. And so you start to see, like they've done on the ICU in Cambridge, you can start to examine these things and pick up when someone might be going into ventricular fibrillation and intervene before they get there. So we're predicting and preventing rather than waiting for them to break and fix, as I'll come a bit later. We've seen that one already. Now let me give you a couple of examples of why information works so well when it's used properly. So NASA, really great organisation. Um, well, Something happened to the slide there. So really great organisation that in 1961 put uh, their first man into space, Alan Shepard. Of course, that was four years, four years after the, the Russians had gone up there and they were getting, they were getting their butts kicked. Uh, and John F. Kennedy said in 1961, well, it's great to put a man into space, but you know, by the end of this decade, we are going to put a man on the moon. And they did. Now, how did they do that? They recreated themselves as an organisation into an information sharing organisation that embraced complex adaptive systems and they got information out to every level of the organisation and they started to talk horizontally in networks. Engineers talking to astronauts, talking to designers, talk, et cetera, et cetera. And they put a man on the moon. Unfortunately, they didn't learn their lessons because then they started to chase financial goals and they went back into hierarchies. Uh, and the Challenger blew up in 1986, which was a real, which was a real uh, tragedy. Um, but th they started to not. And if you look at the Challenger, uh, history of Challenger, you'll find that the information about that was known for six months before it just didn't get to the place where it needed to get to in terms of making a decision about those O-rings. So information in the 21st century is absolutely critical for dealing with complexity. Something's happening to these slides here. Anyway, I'll keep going. Um, so it's, it's really information because what information does is it brings order to chaos. It enables us to understand complexity and the more information we have, the more we can understand it. And that's really important in clinical medicine. Uh, and what, we, what we're about with these systems is our ability to democratise data, to get data to all, all parts of the organisation. Which brings us to our digital health agenda and why it's so important. Now we've got lots of data in health. Everywhere's got data, but it looks like this. 
So it's all over the place. It's all different. It's, uh, and you go and try and find anything in there, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's really difficult. And we're putting systems in that try to help us make sense out of data. Because data is like crude oil. It's very valuable. But unless you, unless you actually refine it, i.e. analyse it, you can't get any real value out of it. Another blank slide. And another one. Oh, it's interesting. Oh. Okay, well, we'll we go on to reimagining. Um, so, so what we're setting out here is we're setting out to change the way we think about the data that we generate, and, and how we can make it work for us more uh, work for us more effectively. And this term reimagine, you'll hear, we, we're going to reimagine healthcare, and it comes from a guy called Eric Brynolfsson, and I'll talk about him if the slide comes up uh, in the not too far distant future. But that, that term you'll hear, reimagine healthcare. Oh, that's a challenge. And what we're moving to are, are these systems here, learning and knowledge-based organisations. Now, pay particular attention to this is because all the data that we have in health is generated by the interaction between a clinician and a patient. So fundamentally, healthcare, ever since the beginning of time really, has been about a clinician sitting down with a patient, exchanging information, asking questions and getting answers. Uh, and then we record that information and we see patterns in it. So the first person who turned up with crushing central chest pain going to their jaw and down to their arm, nobody knew they were having a heart attack. But as we saw it more and more and we were able to record it and share it, the patterns emerged. And we know that that's typical of a myocardial infarct. Uh, and so that, that clinician-patient interaction is absolutely critical. Uh, and all of the data from there is what we capture in a digital health record. And we capture it to the, in a granular to the nth degree. We aggregate it and we analyse it and we turn it into information and knowledge. And then we share that information and knowledge. Look, it's collected once and then used multiple times. Clinical intelligence that feeds back to inform that interaction. Business public health knowledge and research, all coming back to make that interaction more effectively. Now, that interaction is critical, and one of the slides that didn't show up, um, which is a shame because it's the, the key slide of this whole, whole presentation, really, is, is a picture I've got of a patient who's dying of a Stevens-Johnson reaction from having been given penicillin when they had a known penicillin reaction. Now, in the NHS, on average, eight times a year, Someone with a known penicillin allergy turns up at an NHS hospital and is given penicillin and dies of that reaction. That's been like that for 20, 30 years. Every single year, on average, eight people a year that happens to. Now, nobody got out of bed in the morning to deliberately give someone penicillin who's got a penicillin allergy to either prescribe it or dispense it. The reason that that happens is because at that point of decision making of prescription or, or dispensing, the person who did that didn't have the right information at their fingertips at the time of making that decision. So from the day one when you turn this system on, and we saw this in Cambridge, that will never happen unless someone does something deliberately. The system is there to stop that sort of thing from ever happening again. And so this is, in effect, the biggest investment in safety and quality we ever make for our patients. It just transforms from day dot the way we can, we can provide safety and quality to our patients. And as you add in the opportunities when you have these digital platforms, you start to be able to embrace the world of precision medicine through machine learning, artificial intelligence, through embracing genomics or all the other omics by being able to collect data in novel ways uh, and being able to, of course, bring information to that, to that interaction so effectively. And of course, precision medicine is how we are really going to change the dial on how we deal with people individually at a population level and embed sustainability in healthcare. So these are, this is the Brynolfsson uh, paradigm that I was telling you about. It's called the productivity paradox. Uh, and there are two keys to this. So every digital system in the world, when you, when you launch them, it doesn't matter what business you're in, uh, you don't get instant returns in terms of productivity. It takes you a while and you've got to go through a cycle. The first thing is improve the technology. So you're investing, you know, 100 million or so dollars in improving technology and that's exactly what you need to do. 
then you need to reimagine the work that you do so that it makes maximum use of the technology. And then what you find is you go through this cycle three to five times, reimagine the work, that then provokes the technology to improve. The technology improves, you reimagine the work, and you do that three to five times, which is about a year a cycle. So you find that in three to five years, you've embedded, you've improved, you've optimised, and you take off. And that's the sort of time frame you need to be thinking about in that. And Eric Brynolfsson was an engineering professor at MIT. Another oh, blank slide, geez, it's tough. Okay, so what does that mean on the ground? Well, this is a simple paradigm that I put in when I was in the NHS, doing the NHS job. Uh, the digital transformation was about five things. Empowering people, consumers and patients to get involved in their digital journey, really important. Supporting clinicians to provide really great care. You know, go figure, you, you make clinicians' life easier, you give them the right information to make really good decisions, and the patients benefit. Integrate services more effectively, no better way of doing that than by flowing information across traditional silos. Manage the system effectively, that business intelligence that we get out of there so that we know how to manage the business. And create these platforms for the future, all based on these models, uh, all based on these foundations of, of citizen identity, uh, cyber security, information governance, etc., etc. Uh, three horizons that you go through here, and these are shown in series, but in fact they are in parallel. You create the horizon one, which is get the get the technology right so that you can collect the information, then extract information from that and start to use that to inform care, uh, and then move into the, into the future uh, with all of the ability that you have with these uh, data platforms. Um, this is kind of like where we are now, so does anybody know what that is? Yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not a prescription I wrote, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, my secretary gave me a card once with something like that on it and said, a wise doctor once wrote. Um, uh, anyway, that's, that's actually a scribble that Frank Geary did uh, when he was conceiving the uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. He, wrote, he did it on the back of a napkin as he was sitting having coffee. Uh, and it's sort of like an idea. We've got an idea and a concept of what we want to be like uh, and we've got to form it. And where we're moving is to the finished article, which is spectacular if you've ever seen it. Um, and, and it is about our ability to move from data to decision making. So I hope this build works, otherwise I'm in trouble here. So we start down here with, with this descriptive, maybe not. So we start down here with this descriptive diagnostic paradigm, which is a rear view mirror of the world. We can tell exactly what's happened. We can even diagnose why it's happened, but it's already happened, so we're always playing catch up. And this is the broke fix analogy that we're in. People turn up, they're broken, and then we fix them. We want to move up here into this, which is predict, prevent, uh, where we know what's going to happen and we can actually do something before it does. So that analogy with the ventricular fibrillation uh, that I showed you, we can tell when it's going to happen, we can stop it happening. And that's what we're moving with these platforms. You will move from data simply collecting data to actually being able to make really, really high quality decisions every single time anybody across the organisation wants to make a decision. They'll have the right information in front of them to make a really highly effective decision at that point in time. And that's probably all I've got to say. And that's how you transform healthcare. So, you know, welcome to the journey. It's going to be fun. Thank you. So before Keith, before Keith escapes too far, um, we might have time for a question or two. So if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, put your hand up and we'll bring a microphone to you. Otherwise, if you're online, please do it through Slido. Um, and whilst people are getting their questions typed and getting ready to answer and I'm trying to stare down the bright lights, um, Keith, what's the number one thing that you've seen that sort of for patient safety that sticks in your mind that you've seen this type of journey deliver? What's the one big thing that you think about every time? Um, first, uh, first 18 months uh, after we went go live in Cambridge, the system flagged up 8,500 allergy and drug potential issues uh, from a prescription. And we calculated that if 8,500 that caused a change in the prescription. So it flagged up an allergy or an interaction or a whatever. Uh, and um, that wasn't even with pharmacogenomics in the mix. 
Uh, and if you calculate 10 per cent of those being clinically meaningful, that would have caused significant morbidity. It saved 3,500 acute bed days uh, just in that time. That's from the day we flicked the switch. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And no pressure at all. I'm sure Afsel will tell you that. I'm later. sure he will. Okay, Ryan, got the first one over here. Just across to Dr. Coatesworth over there. We're going to make you run as far as the other side. Oh, Grace, if you can. Thanks very much, Keith. I ju just noticed on one of those slides there was. Uh, of those pillars that you introduced, there was one of the um, tabs that said clinician um, performance management. And I'm just wondering, how did the doctors and nurses in, in Cambridge embrace uh, the tool as, as sort of part of um, I thought performance management? Why don't we just say um, accountability? Uh, and, and did you um, foresee any uh, challenges with that? And what were some of the learnings? Yeah, no, it's a really good question because, of course, Performance and accountability now is 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 us as, or was me me as a CEO from when I was there, producing some report and handing it to them and say please explain kind of scenario. What 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 we're able to do when you get this data out to people is is people do that every day as part of their business as part of their continuous improvement cycles. So they're continuously looking at their own performance and benchmarking within. Uh, you know, across systems, across nation, etc., uh, and doing it, doing it as a business as usual activity. So you don't actually have to have a, have a performance team sitting across doing it, generating it. People can actually do it for themselves, uh, and that that they really embraced. Uh, and, and, but and again, it takes a little while to get into there. But uh, one of the things we did in Cambridge was we embedded data anal analysts in all of the business teams, in all of the clinical teams. Uh, not small ones, but all the divisions, so that they would have access to that data day to day and they could uh, improve their performance iteratively without me having to jump up and down on. Wonderful. Thanks, Keith. So we've got a couple of online questions for you. How is your British experience different to the Queensland health experience you have had? Um, look, in many ways it's very similar. So Queensland Health uh, um, uh, uh, has gone with uh, a single instance of an electronic record happens to be Cerner, uh, which is enabling us to, to provide a population-based platform, so far covering 50% of our adult care and 85% of our children's health care, so giving us a fantastic opportunity. Um, that was a, an aspiration in the UK when I was there, when we were conceiving something called the Industrial Life Sciences Program, which was to produce these data platforms across populations of three to five million. Queensland's population is about five million. That, by the way, was supposed to be the post-Brexit economic recovery tool, which generated um, was going to double biotech income from 60 to 120 billion pounds a year. Uh, Cambridge contributed 15 billion pounds a year to that 60 billion straight up, and it was all about information and sharing with the partners on the campus. So we're trying to do that in Queensland, um, and they're still trying to do it in the UK. But I think the the, the, the experience, so the experience is same aspirations, um, wholly different, uh, wholly different setup in terms of the the way the systems governed and run, which it would take me ages to go through. So, <laughs> um, but sa same aspirations, and everybody's on the same kind of journey for one reason or another. Exactly. And look, we might pick up on that English experience for one last question. Um, the NHS has um, nice guidelines which can be incorporated into the system. However, that's not the case here. How can we build a safe system in Australia? Well, generate the data for a start and then get people to analyse it so that you can look for variation. Uh, I mean, th there, are, there are any number of guidelines out there. Uh, Australian Sa Commission for Safety and, and Quality, that's uh, a really good start. Um, every hospital will have them, but it is about building your data sets and then getting them out there so people can use them. Mm. It's not about the patient and safety and quality unit having all the data or the or the uh, accountants want. It's getting it out to the clinicians, the people who work on the front line. That's that's the real. That's where the real system resilience gets built, and our ability to be able to sustain really good healthcare. Wonderful. Look, everyone, can you join me in thanking Keith for his presentation?